Hello everyone, I'm Teresa Miller and welcome to Writing Out Loud. My guest today is science fiction author Mel Odom. I say science fiction author Mel, but you write thrillers and action adventure and just a little bit of everything. So we should just say writer Mel Odom. Thanks for being here. Oh, I appreciate it, Teresa. I've been looking forward to this in a way. I've been very nervous about it. So if my voice cracks out there, we'll all understand. That it's not uh, emotion, it's, it's fear. It's not emotion, it's fear. Fear is a very strong thing. Uh, one of the reasons that I do so many books is I have four children, so uh, right now they're between the ages of 13 and 7, so I work a lot, Teresa, in whatever venue I can find. And so uh, I understand that, and so you want variety, and when people go into a bookstore, we can find your, your books in several different categories. You mentioned you've written a lot of books, and, and I'll say you have over 50. Yes. And I wonder, Mel, when you've written that many books, can you remember all of them yourself? No. You can't. You have people come up talk to you. Well, see, the thing about a book, it's really fresh in your head when you first do the book. And when you're writing it, when you're doing some of the revisions and everything else, when it comes back in galleys, you're very fresh with it. But generally, a book is published a year, 18 months later. And at that time, you'll come up in conventions, you'll come up in areas that you're doing the book signings, and that's another two or three months down the road. And they come up to you and talk to you about different parts of the book they really loved, and you just shake your head and go, oh, gee, I really appreciate that. And then you go back and look it up to make sure it was really in there. But of those 50, and it's probably 50 plus now, do you know the exact number even? I think I'm uh, either on 51 or 52 at this point. I, I would have to go back and count because I've kind of lost. I had My kids were in baseball this year, so I had to keep up with the baseball schedule, and, and that was hectic, and so I don't really know where I am personally yet. See, that's to me a great sign of success that you've written so many books, you're not quite sure how many you've actually done. But of those 50 plus books, do you have some that just stand out in your mind as your very favorites that you just are so pleased that you've written? Lethal Interface, the book that we're talking about today, I guess to, to a degree, or the one we brought to show on camera, Lethal Interface was probably my favorite book because I'd, I'd sold some other stuff and I did some books in different series, and this was the first book I ever did completely under my name. It was not pre-sold. Most of the things I do now, I write, mm -hmm. out, uh, I write out outlines for, and I sell them from the outline proposals. But with this book, I'm kind of superstitious. I grew up in southern Oklahoma, down around Ada, and down <laughs> yeah. around Francis, small yeah. towns. Yeah. And so, all of a sudden, I came up on my 13th book. <laughs> And I got to look at it, and I had three other books under contract. I uh -huh. chose to write this book that I've been thinking about off and on because I have a friend who's really interested in serial killers. So I wrote this 13th book not expecting to sell it because I figured if I was going to shell one out, let it not be one I'd gotten paid for because they want money back <laughs> right, or sure. something there. So I wrote this book, and I made it something that was totally different at that time because I have virtual reality and serial killers in there. So I did my research. I've got a friend who's very interested in serial killers. As I said, he's also worked, contributed to the FBI database in Quantico. And so I got a chance to study serial killers up close, talk to Mike, and I uh, did all my research, and most of them have a sexual kink to them. Mm -hmm. And so I made a guy in my computer, in his virtual reality, mm -hmm. he could go into his computer and have sex with his dead mother. And as I got to thinking about it, you know, I thought, man, this is really risque. This is something people may not, mm -hmm. you know, especially editors. Mm -hmm. And I was warned away from it by several people. Don't do this. Don't mm -hmm. do this. And I went ahead and did it, and it sold to the third publisher we mm -hmm. presented it to. Mm -hmm. And I was really kind of in shock at that time because I realized with it being published, my mother was going to read it. <laughs> and I'm the firstborn son. There's five, five boys in my family. Mm -hmm. And I did what every self-respecting firstborn son would do with his mother. I called her and I said, Mom, they bought the book, but they made me stick all this awful sex stuff in there. So. <laughs> and she bought it. These editors, I mean, they just get away with, with, with all sorts of things, don't they? When, yes. they, when they have yes. poor writers like you that are at yeah. their mercy, yeah, you know, and no telling what they will force you to put into these books into the, in the future. Now, when you write so many books, and, and we say 50 plus, I keep getting back to that number, do you ever worry about repeating yourself? Because I know when I was writing my, my first novel, I had 30 characters. I even worried about coming up with 30 names. Yeah. Uh, do you worry about things? Like that. Sure I do. That's one of the reasons I work in different venues because I do kids books, I do action adventure books, I do thriller books, I do science fiction, I've done comic books, I've done the game strategy guides. I have found if you will simply stretch, you'll, you'd be surprised how much you stretch. I mean if we mm -hmm. could all sit down and plan our lives 
and see how much we actually had to do, we'd be scared to death. Mm -hmm. oh, yes. So in writing, you just stretch and you go with it. And I have found that every time I've made a challenge, whether working with a character, working with a genre, mm -hmm. I have learned something I can bring back to my craft. Mm -hmm. So it's always new for you. Yes, as much as it can be. And even if it's an old like action adventure, I've done most of my books in action adventure, we've got new technologies coming on, we've got new political relationships happening. And I get to explore some of that. And it's not just, I don't try to be, it's tried and true in a way, but in another way, I get to introduce new elements. And I know you have fun with your writing. I can tell that as you talk about it. And one way you have fun is by inserting names of people you know and little details that connect to people yes. you know. Some of the books I do are under contract. I can't reveal that I wrote them at any point. Or they'll track me down and shoot me and kill me. But because that's in there. And, and you'll else. be the subject of someone else's book. It's clause 13. 13 is unlucky. But uh, anyway, so I stick little things in there that for my friends, I'll stick the name in, you know, a last name or a joke that we all share, you know, somewhere in there that... Uh, I identifies it as my book. You know, and writing can sometimes be a lonely life because you have to basically write by yourself. And when you insert these personal elements into a book, does that help you feel more connected to people? No. It, uh, what it does for me, writing is a very lonely life, especially since last year my littlest guy went to first grade. Mm -hmm. I've got four children between the ages of 13 and 7, and it's never been lonely mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because I grew up in a house, a small house. There were five of us boys. I was never knew what it was like to be alone until last year when everybody was in school from 9 till 3.30. Mm -hmm. And it freaked me out. But it's, I enjoy it because, but I also take lunches with people mm -hmm. during the day now. I found a weakness for lunches. Is go. that important for you to keep up the, that personal contact, that social contact? Can writers become too reclusive? Yes, you can because uh, it's the interaction with other people, the interaction with their thoughts, ideas, feelings, everything else that, that bubbles over things inside with you. Because as a writer, you, you seek a certain resonance, I think, mm -hmm. with life. And you're trying, basically, the only life you're trying to explain in your books is yours. Mm -hmm. Different aspects of it. You do the uh, road less traveled thing of if you turned this road, would it have been that way? And that's, how, that's where most of your characters come from. And it is very important to keep that interaction up. A lot of people have a tendency to stay home and not seek that interaction. I've got some friends who do that. But mm -hmm. for me, I'm a very private person, but I love company. Mm -hmm. Small groups of company, not hundreds of people. I think that's an irony for a lot of writers. Private people, but they love company. <laughs> yes. But it has to be company, not a thing. Okay, big social event. Yeah, yeah. That, not, that's what you shy away from. Yes. I wanted to ask you a question. When, when, obviously, when you started writing, your career took off, and you, you've had these 50 books, but how did you get started? What got you jump-started as a writer? Did you always know you wanted to write? Teresa, I have always wanted to write. It's, it's the one thing. When I grew up, I grew up in a little small town. They had uh, television. They had one channel on the television. It came in on a good day when the skip was good. <laughs> and we lived out away from everyone. My dad was extremely uh, private. That's why I'm not real comfortable in social graces because I wasn't raised to, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, raised or reared, whichever way you want to use that. But I was not inoculated <laughs> with social graces. And the things I've learned, I've kind of put together that I kind of make sure I make myself comfortable in areas. But we had no entertainment. It was myself and my younger brothers and the things we did have, I think, that is a sign of a good writer, mm -hmm. a sign of one who's going to succeed in this business. On Sundays, we invited people over, mm -hmm. and you would have families sit together. And with five kids in our family and four to five in other people's family, when they, when the time came to tell stories, when you're finally uh -huh. old enough to tell stories uh -huh. to the adults, you had to be a good one, or you were, you were gone. They would. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pretty tough competition. Huh? Yes, because you had these old master storytellers that could whittle and talk at the same time. And you know, I just try to present a good story, and I think that's where a lot of the, a lot of the skill came from me. And then when I got to go to the library, oh man, I read constantly, and so I developed a love for books. And we should say that you write full time. If this is your job yes. and you, you write from your home, uh, have you always written from your home, or did you have to reach a, a point when you felt secure enough in your writing career to to make, take the plunge and to be a full time writer? Well, in 1988, in January, I sold my first book. It by July of 1988, I'd sold 10 others. So wow. I went from uh, wondering how to write a book to wondering how I could catch up. And that's kind <laughs> of the way it's been, but I enjoy working with the people. But that year I was working, I was a manager at a fast food chain. Mm -hmm. And I ended up without an assistant, which so often happens in mm -hmm. those areas. And so I was working seven days a week on salary, mm -hmm. on salary. Mm -hmm. And I had all these contracts that actually doubled my income. Mm -hmm. And I was paying for childcare. 
I was paying for gas to and from. And so in October, I, I said, look, I need an assistant in here. And they said, well, uh, we don't have one yet. And by the way, Mel, do you want to be a manager or do you want to be a book writer? And presented with that challenge, which is something I'd been asking myself for a while, mm -hmm. I opted out. And I, for the last, I've supported myself and my, my family for the last seven and a half years writing. Was it scary for you at first? Did you go home that night and think, oh my goodness, what have I done? Or did you just know instinctively you'd done the right thing? No, no. There was never, there was never a clue at all that I'd done the right thing. I felt I'd screwed up so bad because <laughs> I grew up blue collar. I grew up blue collar. I'm still blue collar to the bone. And Literally man, blue collar. Yeah, you have one today. on today. But the thing of it is, a man has to have a job, and that's why I try to keep contracts going. Even when I've got things working, I try to sell something else because the only way you can provide for your family is to know you're employed. Mm -hmm. And the only way I can know I'm employed is to look at a contract that's unfulfilled. So I have always worked, but no, I was scared to death. And there's still days I get scared and go, this could all end tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And so to compensate for that, I've taken courses in private investigation because I could always be a PI if I, if I needed to. And I'm also in talking to a guy, as soon as I get some free time, I'm hoping next year, I was hoping to go this summer, but I'm going to go to bartending school. And it's just that way I've got something to fall back on. And I want, I've got my BA in English, and I want to go back and get my master's now. I wish I'm kicking myself now because I didn't then. Well, you're too busy writing books to study books. Yep. <laughs> That's one of the, the uh, I want to ask you a, a question because I know you're a devoted family man and you're, you're at home with the kids. Is it hard sometimes to balance this hectic writing schedule you have with your family schedules? And I know your baseball schedules that have kept you pretty tied up this summer. Uh, oh, baseball schedule this summer was tough. Then I had, I've got football schedules going on right now. I've got my eighth grader. He played his first game on Tuesday. And yes, they're going to improve, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> but he's had a good time. My little guy's in fall ball, but it is tough balancing it. But I don't think about it. I kind of show up that day and see what I have to do, because I can be writing. And I was talking to a guy last night that uh, I've got. I may be doing some business with, and I tell he he asked me the same question. Is it kind of tough mm -hmm. to balance it? And I said, yeah. I said you can be writing this tender love scene to really try to move people and everything else. The next thing you know, you've got a line in there that says, no, I told you no peanut butter and jelly. And he goes, well, Mel, that could be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> it could be dangerous, too. But yes. again, your experience with the kids is really, uh, I can tell, enriches your life because you speak about them, they, they, you're animated. So maybe having them there actually helps you with your writing, do you think? It does because I write real kids. When I do kids in books, I mean, they're kids who cry, they whine, they have snotty noses. I mean, these are real kids. They're not, uh, they're not brats. My kids are, are not brats. They're wonderful. Uh, I love my kids. There's, they are the thing I would do the most for. Mm -hmm. My wife and I get along real well and everything, but your kids are something special. Well, you know, and I've heard so many writers say uh, in interviews that if you want to be a successful, successful writer, that you have to make writing the most important thing in your life, but it seems to me that writing is not the most important thing in your life. No, I think writing is a secondary thing. Writing is a sec. You can write. Uh, you can be in an ivory tower somewhere, and you can write, but do you have anything to write about? Mm -hmm. Living life is the most important thing. Even it's, with all the complications, even with the peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, and the, hey, Dad, I uh, can't get the TV to work. Th yep. You need that yes. to keep you going. Do you ever have writer's block? I mean, obviously, with 50 books under your belt, you haven't had it very often, but do you ever have times when you go to sit behind the computer and the ideas just won't come? And you've oh, got there's a days that your head feels like it's full of oatmeal. I don't have writer's <laughs> block as much because Lawrence Block wrote an article on it, I don't know, seven or eight, ten years ago that I loved, and I've kind of kept it to heart. Writer's block is simply writer's unemployment. <laughs> and I'm blue collar. You're not going to be unemployed. You're going to go sit in there and you're going to work. And if you only get X number of pages today, versus however many you usually get on a really good day, then that's what you got. Mm -hmm. If you're a ditch digger and sometimes the ground is harder, buddy, you're doing your job, the ground's harder. That's why you didn't get as much done. Mm -hmm. and, and so so, you, have, so it's a matter of discipline then. Discipline is one of the things people need to learn first and foremost. There's ways to get around it because you can go into a job where you work a certain number of hours a day and you don't have to learn discipline because they give it to you. Mm -hmm. They tell you to show up at this time, go home at this time, and these are the things you do while you're here. And we don't truly learn discipline, I feel, until you're doing something something that's totally your own. I like the writing. Like the writing, like caring for children, mm -hmm. because that's one of the things, if you pay attention, you do discipline yourself. Mel, we want to talk more to you about uh, Lethal Interface and, and your writing career. Stick around. We're going to take a brief break. We'll be back with more from Mel Odom.
This is an RSU-TV Encore presentation of Writing Out Loud. Hello everyone, I'm Teresa Miller and welcome back to Writing Out Loud. We're visiting with Mel Odom, the author of Lethal Interface and 50 other novels. Pretty close. Pretty close. Mel, we've, we've talked about all the novels that you've written. We talked about, did you have a favorite uh, novel? Even with all of your experience, can you look back at some of your books and say, gee, I'm sorry I wrote that one. Are there any of the books that you wish you could, you could lose in, in, in the writing process? No, because life is always a series of steps. And in the writing process, it's a series of steps also. You can't ever regret taking a step because if you did not take that one, you may have never made it to the next one. So I don't regret, one of the things I don't do is I do not read my books after they're published. Mm -hmm. Because I read them in manuscript form, I read them in galleys, and I can correct them then. Mm -hmm. And I found <laughs> when I re read my books, I simply can't read them because I, I want to get out that blue pencil and go to work. And so I've learned to just leave them alone and be happy. And if somebody comes up and tells me they liked it, then that's what I go with. I bet you've learned a lot writing all those books. As you say, you learn even from the ones that don't work out just like you hope they do. Yep. Is there any one lesson you can point to or, or a series of lessons that have been particularly important to you as a writer? The one thing I think I've learned that has been the biggest help at all in my career is the fact that you have this dream, man. You have this burning dream to write this book a certain way with certain characters and everything else. And it never comes out that way. You can outline, you can <laughs> summarize, you can build everything in there. And it doesn't come out the way you wanted it to. And so I've learned that I've done a good job even when I think I didn't. Mm -hmm. Because people have come up and congratulated me on it. And so I, I hit a responsive chord. And I have to remember that's what I was there for. I was to make somebody laugh or cry. And if I've done that, even if I didn't do it the way I thought I should have, mm -hmm. evidently I did the job. So I've learned to be satisfied, I guess. You know, there are not a lot of, of rules in writing mail that, that we can stick to, but there are a lot of adages that relate to writing, and one of them is that, you know, write what you like to read. Are you writing the sorts of things that you like to read yourself? I grew up with Doc Savage and the Shadow Adventure things, Tarzan of the Apes. I remember when I got my first Tarzan book. And if you write to entertain yourself and to entertain a certain audience, you do have to keep in mind with today's market certain audiences and stuff, but write that book the way that entertains you. If you're going to do a Star Trek novel, if you're going to do a novel in another established series, do it the way you would like to read it. And you'll, be, you'll find you're really successful and you're going to hit that chord in other people. And speaking of success, Lethal Interface has now been published in Russian. Yes. And will be published in German, is that correct? Will be correct? published in Germany. Yeah, German editions are coming out next year. They picked up, I originally did two serial killer Cybertech books. Mm -hmm. And there was Lethal Interface, there's also Stalker Analog that I did. And, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, it, Germany picked it up. They wanted three books like that. And I told them, I don't have three books. Mm -hmm. They bought, they turned around and said, well, will you write one for us? And I said, well, okay. And the deal was made. And so I'm the first American author that Goldwyn Books has ever bought an original from, from what I've been told by my editor, Sky Nonhoff. And mm. it's very exciting, but at the same time, there's a lot of pressure there because I could, I'm blazing a trail here. Let's, you know, Daniel Boone. I'm Daniel Boone country now. <laughs> Daniel Boone and Russia and Germany and everything. I will usually ask guests to read sections of their books, but I bet we can't get you to read a section from the, the, the Russian translation no, of Lethal Interface. Do you think, were there any changes in the translation uh, have, to make the, the book more adaptable to a Russian audience? I have no idea. I have no idea. I've yet to meet someone who can actually read in Russian to tell me. So I, I don't know. It's, uh, it would so be Barnes & Noble hasn't picked that up in this part no, of the country. They haven't the picked it up in this part of the country. Edition. What does it feel like, Mel, when you grow up in a small town in Oklahoma and, and start writing? I bet you never dreamed that your no. words would be really stretching all around the world. Literally. I mean, that's been very, last year was very frightening. <clears throat> and when I found out that the book did really well in Russia and they expected to do really good in because in the quarter, I, it's, just, it's just amazing the expectations everybody has for it. And it seems to be meeting some of those. And I never thought I would ever do something like this. I thought I'd, you know, I'd like to read Louis L'Amour. Maybe I could write a Western. Maybe uh -huh. I could do a little L'Amour. But I didn't know that I would be doing what I'm doing. And I just was not prepared for it. I've had uh, newspaper interviews. And it's very, the first time you see your, name, your picture in the newspaper and stuff. When you're a kid, it's kind of okay. Because mm -hmm. I, I was in there a couple times as a kid. 
And when you're an adult, then it's very strange because I had a lot of people, the first time I appeared in Moore, I'd live in Moore, and the people I went around every day with the video stores, my little guy, he and I went everywhere, we went to all the comic book shops, but they read about me in the newspaper and they found out what I did. So mm -hmm. then they want to talk to me about my job. And we were away at the video shop, so I didn't have to think about my job. We went out to lunch, so I didn't have to think about my job. And then we had to like retreat because people were like talking to us. But you just, you're not prepared, I don't think. Not, not the way I grew up. And you know, I wonder about your kids' reactions to your books because you're writing books that, that young people can really uh, enjoy and connect to in many ways. Are they big fans of your work? No, my first three don't read very much at all. My youngest guy, he hung out with me all the time. I raised him because I quit work uh, working for the fast food place about mm -hmm. six months before he was born. So I raised him at home, changed his diapers, fed him bottles, learned how to type one-handed while I, <laughs> you know, and then if you bounce that baby just right on the knee, you can get a burp. And so <laughs> it, it works and you can keep on one-handed and it slows you down. But Did you list kids, him as a co-author? No, I didn't. <laughs> Although I had to go back and clean up a lot of the stuff he did when he got older because he was hitting the keys. <laughs> so, and it was a lot of fun. But now my kids, uh, they learn to appreciate my job now because they've got extra attention at school and after they started getting attention because of what I was doing what I was doing was just cool with them and before that they would write things well, what does your dad do for a living well he sits at home and plays on a computer <laughs> and I had parents that got kind of cautious and they wondered about me they go, well, what is it you do and I don't generally tell people what I do because then mm -hmm. it invites well I've got this book man if you'd sit down and write the other half of it for yeah, me I, I was going to talk to you about that later man oh, that happens that happens a lot but They've gotten kind of excited about it now. But one of the things I, that kind of really hurt and was really weird because I keep to myself so much. I'm also the block mom mm -hmm. because I was single uh, a little over two years ago. I was single for, with the kids, just my, the kids and myself, for two and a half years. And I got married now to Sherry, and she is probably the light of my life. And uh -huh. she is just the most wonderful person you could ever hope to meet and, and just be with, not, uh -huh. not much less be married to. She's, she and I got married two years ago, a little over two years ago, and it's just been fantastic. But I was a block mom, and I, I made sandwiches. I made kids bologna sandwiches for kids. I didn't even know. I didn't even know they lived on the block. They just bring all these kids over, all my kids, because I didn't let them walk around too much. They needed to be there. But I had one mother <coughs> that my, my daughter had a little girlfriend mm -hmm. when she was nine. And so her mother, or her mother stopped the little girl from coming over to the house. Mm -hmm. And Montana, there's three boys in Montana, so Montana feels the tribe of one mm -hmm. until I got married because now there's her and Sherry mm -hmm. and they do girl things. But uh, she stopped letting her little girl come over the house and so I asked Montana, I said, why is this friend not coming over? And she goes, I don't know. So she talked to her a couple of days. They were riding bicycles and so they bumped into each other's church. It's a church so they ride the bicycles just one house over. Mm -hmm. And the little girl said, well, my mom won't let me come to your house anymore because your dad's unemployed. Oh. <laughs> because all my neighbors never saw me go anywhere. And never realized how hard you were actually working. So, and, and sometimes, too, I don't think people realize how hard riding is yes. and, and, and the stresses that come with that. Another area that you ventured into, uh, Mel, is writing guidebooks for CD-ROM. Tell us just a little bit about that. Oh, man. Uh, I've been doing that since last year. And I had never really played the CD-ROM games because when I'm at my computer, I work. I don't want to turn it into a toy. Mm -hmm. And my kids, I've got two computers. They play on the big one now. But the CD-ROM, they called and talked to me about doing CD-ROM game books. So I got a friend of mine who was really into them, showed them to me. And they are awesome mm -hmm. because the colors, the graphics, the stories, the dialogue, the mm -hmm. voices, everything they do is just so, so neat now. And I got a chance. My first book was Harlan Ellison's book, his game based on his short story, I Have No Mouth I'm, and I'm a Scream, and it's one of the ten most published short stories in the world. Mm -hmm. And so I got a chance to do this, and I just loved it. I loved it. And I got a chance to do a, a lot of guidebooks, they have a recipe, they go here, kick down the door, kill this thing, run like crazy, find the blue fire, and, and go. <laughs> and so they came to me with a new deal, they said, Mel, you're a novelist, do one like a novel. And so I did one, and the only dialogue I put in there was a dialogue that came from the game. And I was real lucky because Harlan had a lot to do with that mm -hmm. game. Cyber Dreams put it out. But Harlan's dialogue was really wonderful to work with. And so I told the sections in first person. And the book has been reviewed. I mean, game books get reviewed and go, well, yeah, it covers all the secret places. But it got reviewed, and they said really nice things about it. When I finished, Harlan Ellison, who's a very tough critic, mm -hmm. uh, complimented me on my work. I mean, it wasn't a, a very outgoing compliment, but uh -huh. a compliment from Harlan. I felt great. 
So obviously you're really plugged into technology yourself. I wasn't. I am. Oh, <laughs> well, I, I guess all writers are pretty much are now, aren't they? I think they should be. Uh, most of the books being written today in any field are going to have encompass some field, some technology we have, especially computers. And when I last year when I got the deal for the CD-ROM, I'd been working on an old 386, mm -hmm. and so I got a chance to. I had to get something different. I had to have a CD-ROM, so I went ahead and got a Pentium. And so I got the Pentium, and I got all the stuff that went with it. And it was like, I was scared to touch it for a while because I thought, man, I'm going to break it. And so I still worked on my old one and did the games on the new one. And I got a chance to do more stuff with it. Later, they want to put me on AOL because actually for them, I don't mail a book in. I just send it over the Internet. Mm -hmm. They get the book. They get the pictures and everything else. And so in getting AOL, I discovered the Internet. And, man, it is a whole new world out there. Do you worry, though, Mel, and, and since you have kids, I, I, I especially want to ask you this, that maybe we're getting too plugged into the Internet, that maybe we're becoming too technological uh, in our society? Or do you just see this as opening up new vistas for us? There is a book out called The End of Work by a guy named Jeremy Rifkin. Mm -hmm. And in it, he postulates that we are now in the post-industrial age and we are in the pre-information age. And that means everything is going to be on computers because mm -hmm. uh, work is shifting, everything's going to computers. And I don't, technology is what you make of it. It can mm -hmm. be a good, it can be an evil. Uh, the virtual reality stuff I did here had to do with sex offenders, uh, serial killers and things. Mm -hmm. But in another book that I did, Omega Blue, mm -hmm. that I did that's kind of futuristic, it was touted as a, an, uh, at that time I wrote it, that it could be a solution to autistic children because you could plug into their world their way. And now, two years ago, I wrote the book about four years ago, and two years ago, I started reading some stuff and discovering Scientific American that, that they're experimenting with software to do that right now. Well, Mel, you've had an exciting career. Uh, I know that there are at least another 50 books in your future. Congratulations on Lethal Interface. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank all of you for joining us on Writing Out Loud.